All right, everybody, welcome to Virtual Bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. We have an amazing event tonight. We have Fred and Freddie No joining me, and we're going to be talking about Jim Beam, some family history. We'll answer your questions. Should be just a great event. So first of all, welcome, guys. Hey, Steve. Glad to be here, Steve. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Glad to have you guys. And just want to talk a little bit, Fred, for you, uh, you know, what's been going on this past year? Obviously, things are so different. You're used to, you know, being out all, all over the road and, and seeing people and, and working with groups and hosting dinners, all kinds of cool stuff. And that's been, it had to be a crazy year not being able to do all that. Uh, it's been uh, a different year. I mean, I haven't been home this long since I started working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, working from the house and just doing stuff like this all virtual yeah mm -hmm. i don't know what the inside of an airplane looks like which is unusual. <laughs> i'm not complaining now i'm not complaining but it's uh, sometimes yeah. it's a little antsy you like to get out there and especially this time of year going down to new orleans i miss mm -hmm. the charbroiled oysters and the shrimp poor boys during lent you know it's usually bourbon festival time so right Right. Maybe I can get Freddie to charbroil me some oysters and we can cook up some shrimp more boys. <laughs> we work on that. <laughs> it's kind of wild because, you know, you do get traveling around and meeting all the people and drinking a lot of good liquor. You get to eat some damn good food. Mm -hmm. I've been having my, my wife's cooking and, you know, a little bit Freddie cooks for me every now and then when I cook for myself and it's not near as good. Right. We get on the road. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, though. This is the time of the year when we'd be getting ready for that New Orleans Bourbon Festival. We've done that for so many years. And uh, yeah, you, you miss that stuff for sure. So and it was right around my birthday. They usually have me a birthday cake. You can mm -hmm. always celebrate pretty good down in Bourbon Street, you know, it's your birthday. <laughs> right. A casino down there where you can go lose a little money if you want to. So, I mean, ain't nothing mm -hmm. wrong with New Orleans, you know, this time of year. After right. Mardi Gras, get rid of the Mardi Gras stuff <laughs> and you can kind of get some of the stragglers that are left behind. But yeah, it's yeah. been an unusual year. I'm looking forward to hopefully things changing and getting back. I just wonder if we ever will get back to where we used to mm -hmm. travel and hit the markets like we used to. I'm sure a lot of events are going to fall by the wayside. I just wonder what the future is of the Bourbon Festival. And, you know, because you start discontinuing things for a couple of years, people forget about it and it kind of goes away, you know, so it's hope. And I know a lot of on-premise accounts will <clears throat> never appear again, I'm sure, all over the, the world as far as that goes, not just mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. So, Fred, obviously, it, it's great having, you know, the two of you guys on here together. And I, I just always wonder what it's like, uh, you know, you grew up, in, you know, in, in a bourbon household. And then, of course, then you have a son and, and he grows up in a bourbon household. And, uh, you know, I've heard some of the stories of, of uh, you know, uh, about you and your father. But what was it like with, with you bringing Freddie up? Did, did you try to introduce him to bourbon, like nosing things early on and stuff like that? Or, or did you just kind of let him gravitate toward himself if he was interested? I tried to use Booker's technique as far as push him away from it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't want a, a teenager getting in trouble, you know, sneaking bottles out of your liquor cabinet or something, and getting in trouble mm -hmm. like Booker did me. And I, he had me nosing things. And I know dad had him smelling you know, I was about might hold it up and let him smell it, but as far as actually touching the bottle, it wasn't none of that. You know, he was uh, he was pretty strict about that, and I understand. We know in, in the social media, wasn't nothing. Yeah, like, you know, back in his day, but like it is now, you know, you're under a you're under like a microscope, really. You know, being mm -hmm. in the industry, you know, if Freddie had have done something when he was under age, it would have been blown out of proportion. Before you know it, you got a black mark by your name. So you got to kind of try to explain to him that people are going to look at you differently than they do your friends. Just because your friends can maybe sneak a drink at their dad's house, you can't do it at our house because of who we are. And it's, you know, it was, it was tough on him, I know. I'm sure he still, he pulled a few things. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't want to get into that. I want to have to come I didn't clean. do anything wrong. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have his first drink until he was of legal drinking age, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> sure. So, <laughs> and, and of course, the role's reversed now, Freddie. You've got uh, two two children now. Yeah, and yeah. and what, what what are you doing with uh, as a parent now? I, you know, I, I do, you know, as Dad said, Granddaddy used to let me smell it quite often if he was picking Booker's batches or 
or who knows, probably trying to show somebody something or teach them something. Uh, he let me smell. So I do, <clears throat> like I sent you that photo the other night of Kay and I going through yeah. some whiskey. When we were done, I called Braley down. And I had three or four that I had of our stuff, you know, that I was working on. And I asked her to pick which one. I don't really try to get her. I just say, which one? Because she's like, it all burns. So I just try to make it of which one is the, the least – makes you want to smear your nose then if you think it's all terrible which one is the least uh-huh. <laughs> and i try to dig into elements of things and sometimes she says that kind of remember reminds me of one you gave me before and, and stuff like that so i try to but i again like he said it's it's definitely not a hey you're welcome to come do this stuff it's like hey smell these and tell me what you think of this right here is there anything you can pick out um you, you know you you got to try to let them be a child as well. You know, that's part of it too is yeah. If even if they are very interested, you kind of want to keep them away because you want to let them be a child. And, and I guess, you know, people ask me, when, when did you realize who Jim Beam was? I don't know. It's not like I remember a day when I was like, man, Jim Beam is a man. That's my great, great grandfather, but this famous whiskey as well. You know, I, I don't, it just kind of like comes to you, I guess, over time. And I guess I just remember having a normal childhood. So that's what I try to drive to her and hopefully to book her as well is this is really cool. It's an honor. Mainly I, I try to put it like, you know, come watch your grandfather speak. This is a really cool event or come, you know, this is important for our family, like the 16 millionth barrel fill, make those things show the importance of them. Cause when you get older, you'll know that that's why you'll see that it's important and you, you'll, I cherish those moments. I was actually speaking about that earlier today with some coworkers. I remember hating dressing up, going to these, you know, I think it's the nine millionth barrel fill. <laughs> uh-huh. When I really remember. And I hated dressing up. And then we're standing out in the sun. It's hot as hell. But now looking back at it, I just remember granddaddy saying, oh, you'll be all right, boy. It's all right. It's all, you know, and just thinking about that day. So. Um, it's a good memory to have and you know if I would have threw a fit and they didn't make me go I wouldn't have it so <laughs> it's one of those kind of things you know you make them do some but keep them distanced enough that they know they're they just got to have a normal childhood that's key live your life yeah Fred I don't want to get too family sappy or anything like that but I do have a question father to father so I've got a, a child and I'll tell you anything that I've done in my career I, I, I could care less about it but the things that my daughter is doing now she's out on her own she's 24 years old she's she's accomplishing a lot and I, I get so excited about the things that she's doing and she's been promoted up in, in her company already and, she, and it's just it makes you excited what's it like you know having Freddie and seeing all the things he's doing the little book series is obviously fantastic uh, he, he's really creative with what, what he's got going on just as a dad, what's what's that like having your son uh, you know, oh, doing all these things? It's the best feeling in the world to see, you know, Freddie succeed at what I was hoping he would do, you know, because mm-hmm. it was kind of like Booker's goal coming through the whole business was to prepare me to take over so he could leave. Yeah. And I'm kind of walking in those same footsteps and seeing Freddie take a hold of the bit, as they say, like the horse racing He's picked up the bit and he's going for it. Yeah. He's created a little book. Uh, he's also creating a lot of other products. And he works, you know, in new product development. He's got these forward thinking and he does promotional stuff just like this. So the company, you know, at the old beer truck theory, if I walk out the door, get run over by a beer truck tonight, the Jim Beam will continue on and be in great hands because he's prepared. You know, he's done his time. He's done everything. And, You'll be fine. I mean, the company, the family legacy will continue on. Mm-hmm. And now it'll be his job to get either Braley or Little Booker, uh, get them like that. Right, right. <laughs> but you feel like you've kind of done your deal, you know, when you get to the point. Because there were times, I'll be honest, that I didn't know if he was really going to be involved in, in the bourbon business. He talked about being a lawyer or all this other stuff. And I said, like, man, <laughs> what am I going to do? I don't want to work till I die. You know, right, right. All of a sudden, the light came on, and he had an interest. I said, "Well, the opportunity's here. Give it a shot." And that's all you do is just have the opportunity there, and make sure it's his decision, not forced into it. Because he heard from ten thousand people, I'm sure. Are you going to follow in your father's footsteps or your yeah. grandfather's footsteps? You know, because walking in those, like Booker always told me, "Don't try to be me. Be yourself." 
enjoy it. This is your life. If you don't enjoy it, shit, if it's, if it's torture, you're not going to want to do it. So you have to, it's more of a lifestyle, really, the bourbon industry is. And once you get into it, it's pretty cool. You meet some real good people, people you work with. I mean, I don't know of another industry in the world that's like the bourbon industry. I mean, with Jimmy Russell's of the world, you know, Parker, when he was around, dad and them, how they all got along and really, you know, our comrades. You go to Whiskey Fest, hell, the bourbon guys are all hanging out. It's not like we're taking pot shots at each other like the hillbillies up in the mountains. You yeah. know, we're, we're, we enjoy each other. We have fun. We like sharing whiskey. And it's cool. And to watch our sons, you know, like me and Eddie Russell, we laugh about Bruce and Freddie now coming along. They're going to be the next generation. Yeah. We're, gonna, we're not going to wait around and be at work as long as Jimmy. <laughs> there ain't no way in hell we're going to be here. Yeah. Oh, y'all too young to retire. No. We're going to be fishing on Fred down at the lake. Yeah. We got that lake house. We're going to be down there drowning worms. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what it's all about. And yeah. enjoying it. You are proud of your children to watch them succeed in what they're doing. And, you know, you kind of hope they do what you want. I mean, I got a lot of friends whose children aren't doing that good. But you yeah. know, ready to do like he's done. It's been great. I, mean, I got no complaints. Yeah. Yeah. As you see what he's doing now, it's, it's like, yeah, that's, that's what he should be doing. But so many people are crushed under, you look at the personality as big as bookers and then you huge personality. And to follow that, there's just a lot of people who have a hard time handling that, dealing with that. But Freddie is coming into his own. He's his own person. I, I mean, it's, it's fine. It's, that's the main thing is just telling him, be yourself. Yeah. Be yeah. yourself and don't worry about what I did or what Booker did. That was one thing. When I started traveling, people would say, you drink as much as your dad? Hell no. <laughs> you take drinks of bourbon. And I mean, it was amazing. And I was, when I was younger watching him, I mean, he would take a big, big drink of, of bourbon, 100 proof, and just chase it with a little shot of water. And when I started falling around, people thought I could do that. I said, ain't no way. That was Booker, you know. <laughs> I, do well, not care, but I, I, I think you do. I, I, now I hear, I've heard a story that, and I think it was actually, you verified it in an article that I read one time. And I was a big fan of Chris Penn. I liked him in Reservoir Dogs. I liked him in so, several other movies. I know he was a Booker's fan. Uh, that was, yeah. that was something that, uh, that he liked. And I heard one time you guys went toe to toe. Uh, who, 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 and I heard he, he, he dropped before you did. You, you beat him. Well, we, he was a big guy. No, like no, we won't talk about that too much, Steve. We were, we had a mutual friend in Los Angeles. Uh, actually, actually, he actually passed away this year with COVID. But anyway, he said to Chris, that's all Chris drank was Booker's. If you didn't have Booker's, he left the bar. Yeah. And so we're going to get you two hooked up. I said, all right, all right. So one time we'd had an event. And he happened to be in town. And sure enough, we ended up at Rebecca's. That was the name of the bar. And we started drinking Booker's. And what we did... We both took out $10 and we did a $20 bill and we signed it. And whoever was standing last got the $20 bill. I ended up with a $20 bill, but I don't remember standing. standing. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We, we had a lot of fun drinking. It was just bookers and water. That's all it was. We, we were drawing a pretty good crowd at the bar there. <laughs> and it was like shot for shot, shot for shot. But I'll be honest, I think he was sneaking in the bathroom and was uh, had some some kind of uh, something. He was just about ready to go down. And all of a sudden, he goes to the bathroom, come back, and he was wide awake. <laughs> <laughs> I think he might have had a little snout powder or something. There, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, helping, <laughs> helping him stay awake. I thought I had him two or three times. And we had, we had a good time. Every time you I got him. Out, you yeah, got him in the end. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's we good. Would, uh, we'd always yeah. hook up and have a drink or two, but that's all he drank. If he didn't have bookers, he wouldn't drink anything else. And all yeah. the bars in, right down there on the, in LA, they would keep bookers because he tipped well. That's what the bartenders all said. He tipped well. He tipped well. Oh, okay. That's, that's always good to know. And, uh, I think that is a little bit of a testament to the person. So, and I, I always liked him and I always thought he seemed like a, a normal person. I know he had his issues, certainly, obviously, but yeah, uh, yeah he seemed like a, you know, at heart, a good guy. So yeah. uh, he was yeah. getting in shape for another movie and that's when he had his heart issue. Yeah. That's too bad. Working out. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, there's a lesson to be learned there, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'm not going to work out any after, after that story. Yeah. So, Fred, you talked a little bit about, you know, you didn't know if Fred would get in the business or not. I, I And I, I've heard uh, some stories about you. You didn't necessarily know if you were going to do it. Tell us a little bit about kind of going through that time, Fred, your kind of your college years as to and, and getting into the business. Well, Booker, see, didn't ever finish college. He went off to UK to play football for Bear Bryant uh, back in 1949, and it didn't quite pan out, and he just disappeared. I mean, he just, I guess he kind of ran away or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so when he did finally come back home and get in the business and do that, he had one rule that I had to finish college. And my, I was a, much like my father. My scholastic skills were not as strong as my social <laughs> skills. And so, you know, when I, I bounced around from a few colleges and he kept saying, are you going to get out of college? Well, finally, after eight years, <laughs> and a lot of Booker's money and a lot of transferring and a lot of D's and F's falling off my college transcript. I finally acquired 120 credit hours and I got my degree from Bellarmine College. Uh -huh. At the time, they didn't really have a position open down at Beam. You know, there was not, they just didn't keep a hole and say, well, here's a spot right. for Booker's son. So at the time, Jim Beam was sponsoring a country music band. Uh, I'm like, you might know. Hank Williams Jr. both sure. seasons. Yeah. And I got to be buddies with Hank taking dad to concerts and stuff. And so while I was waiting for a job to open, Hank was touring. And they said, well, hell, just take a ride with Hank for a while. So I jumped on the bus. I'd meet him at the truck stop when they'd come through, stop by the plant, pick up a few cases of, of whiskey, uh, meet him at the truck stop, unload the whiskey from my truck to the bus and then get on the bus and ride. And when they came back to Nashville, they dropped me off. And during this period of time, they had a, a position open up and I was offered a job. And I remember telling my dad, I think I found a job. He said, doing what? He said, going on a road, right? Said, I'll be damned if you are. And I said, Honey, that's no life for me or you, boy. So uh, I remember in about two to three weeks, they had me on night shift bottling line supervisor <laughs> i think they fired the night shift bottling line supervisor. <laughs> he was kind of a shady operator uh -huh. from what i heard yeah they, they got rid of him and stuck my ass in the night shift bottling line <laughs> got me from going on the road with hank but it was uh i had a lot of fun with it kind of i might have forced my dad's hand a little bit to get me a job but after i got in there i liked it you know that's where i needed to be i could probably not be here today if I'd have pursued that country music, riding in right. buses and drinking all that liquor, that <laughs> tends to be most of the boys I was on the road with, they've all dried out by now or mm -hmm. they've had a lot of issues. So yeah. I think I took the right career path. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's, that's great stuff. So, and, and Freddie, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, you were looking at being a lawyer at one point or at least do it. Was any of that ever serious or, or you, or were you always going to come to be? I don't, you know, part of it, it was funny because one of granddaddy's best friends was a lawyer and they argued all the damn time <laughs> about anything and everything, uh, Jack Kelly. And I, you know, I guess I got to argue with granddaddy and he said, you know, boy, you'd be a good damn lawyer. I guess he was just comparing me to Jack because him and Jack argued. And so then I thought, well, you know what, that ain't bad. Then I started kind of looking into it and I see that, you know, you make pretty good money and all the lawyers <laughs> dress nice. So I thought, well, this can't be a bad idea. I might do that, you know? Uh -huh. And um, obviously I think I was a sophomore the first time we had a job fair at, at high school. We didn't freshman year. I don't recall doing it, but, so I went with Jack's son, who was a lawyer as well, and uh -huh. I spent the day with him. And I was fine until you know, right before lunch or something, and somehow he got to talking about school and asked me about my grades. And so I was kind of honest, I'm not the best. He's like, well, I don't know, Freddie, you know, it's, it's going to be eight years in college for, you know. <laughs> and I said, what? I didn't know that, you know. I, <laughs> I didn't fucking clue. <laughs> so, I'm kind of like, what do you mean? He said, well, you got to get your degree and then you go to law school from that. And basically to get into good law schools, you got to be at the top of your first classes, you know? So I was already second thinking it. 
I just get the more I, I thought about it, I was like, there's no way in hell I can go to college for eight years. There's so, you know, at a very young age, it kind of fizzled out. It was, I guess, kind of ironic is granddaddy passed, you know, probably I'd say within six months of this time frame. Uh-huh. Just that's kind of really what got my interest in the in you know seeing what was available there. You know, I've seen so many people come to his wake and talk about um, you know how he had an impact <clears throat> on them or their family or you know the whiskey has. And I just thought you know this is so. There, I mean, I'm talking about a bunch of people. It just seemed like forever standing there listening to these people give their condolences, and they just, each of them had an individual story. It wasn't just you know, sorry for your condolences. So it, that it's kind of like that, that scenario played out perfectly. You know, I found out I was going to have to go to school for uh, a double time. And then, you know, I got real interest in at least understanding more about what dad and granddaddy were, were kind of doing. And I guess really that's kind of where my head started shifting from that point. Uh, I'd say we had some arguments between then and when I went to work there where I said, I ain't, I ain't coming to work with your ass. You know, I, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to yeah. deal with you sitting here at dinner. I sure as hell ain't working with you. You know, uh, father <laughs> son, you, don't want to, you know, at some point your father is not too smart and you don't want to do that. Hey, that's crazy. But then all of yeah. a sudden you realize oh, that ain't so bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it could be worse. Yeah. It was just funny to me how you know, I said it to Kay a while back. It's kind of funny how our relationship changed when I went from having D's and F's like he did in college to getting A's and B's. I never he got to A's and B's. So I'm like, man, I'm a dumbass. I should have flipped this around a little bit sooner. Man, if I would have been smarter and got A's and B's in college, me and Booker would have got along a lot better in my college. <laughs> <laughs> he was just looking at those checks he was having to write, paying for that college and looking at the report cards. Like, God dang, are you ever going to get out of school? I said, yeah, I think I will. When? He wanted to get that win. He wanted to be able to right. put a date down, put a line in the sand. And my mother kept telling him to be quiet. You never finished college, so shut up. <laughs> and luckily, mom worked at the hospital, so she she carried a job too. So it was like, she could kind of shut him down a little bit for me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) What's so great about this business is, you you know, you have to also respect all the history, all, all all that's been done before you and stuff like that. And, you know, I look up to to you guys like, like you can't believe, and you know, Fred, you're, you're, you're at the the top of, uh, of the mountain, but then again, we've got Jimmy Russell here. So there's someone even higher than the top of the mountain. Having that guy, what, what what does he mean to you? Oh, he's, He's been a second dad to me. I mean, mm-hmm. Booker and Jimmy were like two peas in a pod. And when when dad was, was ailing in health, Jimmy called me more than probably anybody checking on his buddy. Yeah. When when he passed away, we probably cried more than me and mom did. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, those two lived this bourbon life and they they you know they brought, I think they were two of the guys who brought bourbon back. I mean, if you look at where bourbon was in the 70s, yeah, we closed our Boston plant. We didn't even need it. Yeah. The Booker No plant was wow. shut down and mothballed. I mean, there was no demand for bourbon. But those guys developed these high-end bourbons, went on the road, and started educating people on bourbon and rekindled the fire under the bourbon category that we're all living yeah. today. I mean, we, we learned from them. I mean, they're just... They, they're the elder statesmen of the bourbon industry, you know. It's, it's yeah. been great. Except for the guys that brought it back after Prohibition. I mean, you know, look at Jim Bean, who was 70 years old and brought us back, our family back in the business after Prohibition. I look at Jimmy and Dad and Parker, Elmer T. They were the guys that got the bourbon industry going again after it kind of went through its downtime in the 70s. You know, we all – to be thanking them for what they did. You know, they worked diligently to create the products and to keep pushing and educating. I think that's a lot of it, educating the consumers. You know, people like you who are out there getting the good word out to folks. That's what it's all about. People want to know what they're drinking and being transparent, showing them what it's all about, telling the stories and enjoying a drink with people. I think it's it's cool to be able to do it. It's, turns a conversation into a party. It's great. Yeah. yeah. 
And obviously, you know, we got to talk obviously about Booker. I mean, such a, such, you know, just one of the all time greats, somebody who's in that conversation when you're talking about the Mount Rushmore of people from the world of bourbon, he's in that conversation. Is he one of the four people that go on the side of that mountain to, to represent bourbon? And I, I think he's definitely in that conversation and very well could end up on there. And, you know, tell us, you know, some of the stories, what he was like, the, the, the person, you know, we, we know some of the, the bourbon stuff, but what was the man like? What was Booker like? Oh, he was, he never met a stranger. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he would do anything for anybody. I mean, if a salesman would come by the plant selling him something down there, maybe coal or widgets or whatever, he'd bring them home and feed them supper. If he liked them, if he struck, if he struck a conversation, he'd call my mom, put another table, put another plate on the table. I'm bringing so-and-so home. Yeah. And it'd be somebody he just met, but he loved people. He loved talking to people. He, he talked forever. He always had stories. And he'd do anything in the world for, for anybody in the industry, out of the industry. He didn't care. Pretty simple, liked to hunt, liked to fish. And that was about it. You know, he didn't have that many hobbies other than hunting and fishing. I mean, he would mess with stuff. We kind of laughed some of the stuff that he, he fixed. I think me and Freddie are still mm. the dealing with those today. Yeah. oh yeah you know some of his engineering around here at the house we're discovering that he wasn't as great an engineer at the house as he was with the <laughs> distillery but it was uh, it was funny you know over the years as i traveled i would meet engineers and different people and they said your dad could draw a drawing of the distillery on a lunch sack better than a civil engineer could he said he would draw up how this steel worked or how this Really? It was talked about how Booker understood the distillery, knew exactly how it worked. Even though he didn't have a college degree, he knew exactly what made that whiskey and why it tasted the way it did. And it was amazing the way that could, Don Calhoun, one of his old buddies, our plant manager, would bring in glasses of whiskey, bourbon from all the different distilleries. Mm -hmm. Dad could taste them and tell you every time whose was whose what it was, he just knew from the way it was made, why it tasted that way. Bourbon was Booker's life. I mean, he was, it was a, he loved it. I was his second child. The distillery was the first child. <laughs> I was the second child, mother I always said. It was kind uh -huh. of funny. He got the, the Booker No plant in 1954, I think, and I was born in 57, so <laughs> it was, but that, that was yeah. his life, you know, and that's all he wanted to do was make bourbon pure country hands yeah. maybe make some beaten biscuits every now and then but. some beaten biscuits a little wine from now and then tell us about those kind of quirky hobbies was he you know it, it sounded like he was really like when he was into the biscuits he wanted to make the best biscuit that, that oh, he yeah. Could. So, yeah tell us about kind of some of that stuff <laughs> he'd make those biscuits and when he thought he had them made the best he'd have to tweak the recipe uh-huh you know, if we do this we'll get a little better it might be better might be worse might be better might be worse but he's always changing. He never, I remember he got on a salt rise and bread kick one year. He was great. He got to the point where he was grinding his own grain with a uh, KitchenAid mixer. He got a, a grain grinder and put it on his, my mom's KitchenAid mixer. Yeah. And was doing his own starter. Some of his loaves of bread, you could have laid them in a wall. They were so hard, so heavy. <laughs> you know, but it was, he just always wanted to perfect whatever. He was doing, mm -hmm. and he remembered how things were when he was a kid. You know, his mom made this type of cake or this bread or this, and it don't taste like mom's did. It don't. We need to do this, make it taste like mom's. And my grandmother would say, "Yours is very good. It's probably better than mine. You just can't remember how it used to be." Mm -hmm. He would argue with his mother about, <laughs> "No, no." <laughs> but it was just my dad always pursuing something a little better. And I think that's where the bourbon industry, same deal. He was always tinkering with stuff and in the distillery, you know, if I bypass this tank or if I run this beer at this temperature, if I do, you know, preheat this or do that, what's that do to the final product? He was doing research and development that nobody even knew at Bean. Mm -hmm. He was at Boston and nobody knew anything what he was doing because he was like all by himself. Yeah, so yeah. 
it wasn't like the small batch collection were literally things that he had been kind of tinkering with on the side they weren't anything that it was assigned or they told him to do he was just kind of doing uh, that stuff right that's that story of booker's is actually going to be released this month the man mike donahoe who was a sales uh vice president it was funny mike telling the story i hate to let the cat out of the back he's going to be telling it with the media and stuff when we release donahoe's batch of bookers which oh, is cool it's yeah. going to be the first batch i've been trying to go back and relive parts of booker's bourbon history like kathleen de benedetto we named the batch for her she was yep. the first brand manager and so mike was telling the story that you know every christmas here we were at Jim Beam giving away boxes of candy and flowers to our distributor partners for Christmas gifts. Yeah. Said, what in the hell are we doing giving chocolate and flowers when we're a bourbon company? So he got to talking to Booker and he was down at the distillery and he said, what, you know, what's going on? You got any, he said, I got something I've been working on here, Mike. And he pulled out a bottle out of his desk drawer and it was uncut, unfiltered bourbon, which at that time, there were no uncut, unfiltered bourbons, yeah. or scotches or any of that shit in the 80s. He poured Mike a shot of that. And Mike said, this doesn't taste like in the gym beam. I've tasted it. He said, no, no, Mike, this is the real stuff. This is before we start filtering. And he explained to a sales guy what chill filtration was what reducing it to 86 proof was. This is 125 proof. And so Mike Dono went back to Chicago and told the, you know, the president of the company, we need to turn Booker loose. We got the biggest, best mind in bourbon sitting down there in Boston and he's got better whiskey than he's drinking out of his desk drawer. <laughs> and he yes. Said, At least let's give it to our distributor partners as Christmas gifts. They said, okay. So they, he called dad and said, it was funny, these, these marketing girls were asking the stories today. Well, do you got any of the emails? He said, email? <laughs> we didn't have computers back in them days. We didn't right. have on the phone. When, when I wanted to talk to Booker, I called him. And he didn't, that's what I told him. I said, Booker never had a computer. Mm -hmm. I don't think he ever, he had a fax machine, but as far as the emails, so he, they just conversed. And the first batch, dad found some wine bottles down here in Bardstown somewhere. They actually did it by hand and Mike gave them away as Christmas gifts. And he's got letters. He saved these letters, which we're going to bring out this, this uh, month of some of these distributor folks saying, where is this? Where, where is this bourbon? Can we get more of this stuff? That's cool. Really, Christmas gifts created the small batch bourbon because they started the Bookers and the other ones followed thereafter. You know, they didn't have any budget. You know, this was back in the day when we don't have any budget. What are we going to do? Well, we'll just get right. some bottles. We dipped them in the wax. They had an old broken crock pot. They fixed it, dipped it in wax. The ladies down in our WLD section wrapped them in tissue paper and we gave them away as Christmas gifts. And as they say, the rest is history. And then now everybody's got cash strength bourbons, you know, small oh, yeah. bourbons, all that stuff. And it was just dad sharing the whiskey that he was drinking and playing with. And all of a sudden somebody in our company saying, well, let's take his stuff to market or give yeah. it away as gifts. And then the distributors wanted more of it. And that's how it really came about. Yeah, that, you know, and it's, it's so relevant today. I mean, that's, that's exactly where the bourbon industry is at today. Uncut, unfiltered barrel strength. I mean, Booker's is as fresh today as it was when it de debuted. I mean, that's, it's, it's so relevant. So uh, yeah, again, your father was very uh, ahead of his time. I mean, he was a visionary to, to where we're, we're at today. A lot of people that gave him, well, I mean, we first released it at the bourbon festival here in Barstown. There was some people mocking us, you know, making, I, I guess, food. yeah. You know, you know, they're about Miss Small Batch, and they had a, a girl that was about 350 pounds in a, in a <laughs> uh, beauty contest looking you know, <laughs> evening gown with Miss Small uh -huh. Batch. You know, and it was kind of funny, you know, at the time they were just making fun of us, of Booker for doing this stuff because he was taking the bourbon industry in a direction that nobody had ever seen before. 
Yeah. But now if you look, they've all got the same style products. You know, they copied it. I guess what is flattery is and when you start copying, but you know, dad knew what he was doing. He he knew what was good. And uncut, yeah. that way you can cut it yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you want to drink. And Mike Donahoe obviously has an important role in bourbon history too, because obviously this all falls on your dad for what he did, but Mike, you know, that, that in between headquarters and, and Booker, which you needed to have somebody, but I understand Mike was a former NFL player and that's yep. kind of the way that he and Booker connected. He obviously had that, yep. that football connection. Yeah. He played for the green Bay Packers and San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. There was a lot of ex pro athletes that worked at beam at the time, Rich Reese, who was our CEO. He played for the Minnesota Twins. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we were a lot of ex-football players and stuff. Because back in the day, I guess a lot of their sales guys, they liked recruiting ex-athletes because they could make them as a team, you know, coach them as a team and right. get the job done. And that was uh, kind of, the, I guess, the mantra of Beam. I mean, when we looked around, if everybody was an athlete of some kind. <laughs> used to have our sales meeting on Super Bowl weekend. And it was a big time, you know, get together and, I mean, nobody minded not going to the Super Bowl. They liked getting together and drinking and carrying on and talking about sales and doing it. So it was in January. So it was uh, mm-hmm. always yeah. cool. Dad loved it, you know. Yeah. Did get a request in to hear kind of a, a clarification uh, on the uh, story with Booker and the ham in the restaurant. Do you, do you, is, is that one you can tell us? Yeah. he Dad loved country ham and traveled, you know, as you know, quite a bit. He was on his way to Alaska for a fishing trip. Mm -hmm. And on the way, the folks in Chicago asked him if he would come through and do a PR stop and do a media luncheon and, you know, do the the normal stuff that we do. He said, sure, because he was going to drive. They were driving to Alaska, him and his friend Jack Kelly. Yeah. And so they had a country ham in the back of the the van and you know they were going to cruise up and fish that was the only food they took too yeah. it was just a loaf of bread, <laughs> loaf of bread and a country <laughs> ham. Yeah, that's, about all they, that's all you need yeah. a jar of mayonnaise they always yeah, had yeah, a jar yeah. of mayonnaise <laughs> but they, they went to a went to lunch in a restaurant in chicago and they had country ham on the menu and my father was kind of fella if he saw it on the menu he's gonna order it you know uh-huh and when they brought what they thought you were was doomed instantly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was going to be a food critic. Yeah. Not 101. Yeah. <laughs> they brought the ham, set it down. Obviously, it was not country ham. <laughs> Might have been some type of pork, but it was not country ham. Uh-huh. And dad was kind of the kind of fellow, if something wasn't right, he was going to say <laughs> something about it. <laughs> he was you know, in front of God and everybody. You know, he didn't care. <laughs> and he had made a little, a little scene, I guess. Uh-huh. And he had, he had a PR guy there. He said, go out to the truck and get the country ham. <laughs> Jim, you can't bring food into a restaurant. <laughs> this time, my father, when he started getting a little upset, you did what he wanted to do. <laughs> I mean, somebody's ass was going to get tore. You'd be better to be somebody else, not you. Uh-huh. Jim went and got the ham. Well, Maitre D came over, was kind of upset. And so Booker, he pulls his ham out, puts it on a table in Chicago in this nice restaurant. And he had his butcher knife, you know, he brought the knife. <laughs> of in, course, yeah. Slicing it off and he's giving out. He said, bring the chef in here. I want him to taste this. This is what real country ham is. And by this time, he's handing ham out to everybody sitting around because they're looking like, what's this guy doing? He brought uh-huh. in this big head leg of a hog. And he's cutting it off right there at the table. And the chef come in there and he shook his head. He said, well, I don't know what it is, but that's pretty good. <laughs> he actually did bring a country ham into a nice restaurant. <laughs> um, Adrian, yeah. um, she's just somebody, a girl that we met. Hold on here. She does Gotta put you on mute there. there. There you go. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Yeah. See, it was it was crazy, and it, yeah. it really happened. You know, stuff like that always happened to Dad because he didn't care. He would tell you know if it was good, he'd tell you. If it was bad, he'd tell you. He had a comment for everything. Yeah. Nobody yeah. really seemed to mind because he, you know, he wouldn't get out of line. It was something you had country ham on the menu, but what you had really wasn't country ham. He was calling you out. <laughs> so 
uh, were, were these guys, you know, friends, would they hang out outside of, you know, business functions and, and, and meetings? Would, would uh, uh, they, they do things? Would they come over to the house? And Freddie, as a, as a kid, did you remember seeing people from the bourbon industry coming over and stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dad always invited people over. I mean, he was, mm -hmm. he loved to entertain. Jack Kelly, the lawyer Freddie's talking about, he ate supper almost every night at our house. And Toogie oh, really? Dick, who runs Kurt's restaurant, she'd bring fried chicken up from the restaurant or from, they would she'd bring the leftovers, whatever yeah. they. Top she, shelf. Yeah, top, uh -huh. yeah. top yeah. shelf. Stuff that was left over at the restaurant, she'd bring it and they'd have a drink or two and sit and chew the fat and argue about something. It was funny, Jack would spit out a big word, you know, and Booker, what's that word mean? Jack would give him the definition. He'd send my mother in yeah. to get the hey, world. Get the dictionary. Get the dictionary. <laughs> get the dictionary. <laughs> and to verify that his word really meant what Jack said it meant. They, that was just their life. They loved to just argue and just good friendly mm -hmm. banner back and forth. And, mm -hmm. you know, just have fun, hang out, go fishing. They go down the lake. They want to have supper. They might go down, let's go catch eight bluegill. <laughs> he had it figured out that he would eat four, Jack would eat three, mom would eat one. <laughs> they get just the number they needed. Uh huh. Clean them and cook them for supper that night. And wouldn't like to go down there and catch a whole boatload. They just go catch how many they needed. What they needed, yeah. Yeah, and Freddie would go with them sometimes, and he. I try to get the boatload. He, <laughs> uh -huh. he didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Then you got to clean them all, boy." <laughs> You just pick the number, the number you need. You need 10, you get 10. You need That's 10. what you do. Yeah. 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 And, and Freddie, you used to, you know, even fish on the grounds. And what, what was that like with your grandfather? Was it just, would you guys just talk about grandfather, grandson stuff? Or would it be industry bourbon stuff? Or what would yeah, you, was, what would you do? I mean, honestly, if he, if you weren't fishing, you know, pay attention, boy, you ain't watching your line. It wasn't much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was a serious fisherman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you yeah. let him go, you know, you ain't setting that hook right. Come here, I'll show you. And he was adamant you were going to do it the right way. He knew why you weren't doing things. He, you know, he watched. But, I mean, we would talk a little bit, yeah, but mostly it was about fishing and being patient, you know, because I'm like, I'm going to move over here. No, just, you know, be patient. Just sit there. <laughs> If I cast and it wasn't a fish on there, you know, just like Braley, it's funny. She hate she loves fishing when she's catching, but when she's not catching fish, she's ready to come home. She likes catching, not fishing. Mm -hmm. That's the way I was. So you know, it, that that was a lot of it. But he was uh, definitely adamant on on catching the fish, not letting them get away. You know, <laughs> it was. Dad always liked to teach you something. Oh, yeah, that was his book. Was, I tell you, Steve, it was funny. If he gave you a distillery tour, yeah. before the tour was over, he's going to ask you a question of something you should have learned on that tour. Okay, yeah. If you don't recite it, goddamn, Steve, were you listening when I told you <laughs> about that sermon, or were you listening when I told you about that hammer mill? Or, uh -huh. and I said, why do you do that? He said, God damn it, boy. You got to teach people something. You just don't talk to be talking. <laughs> I mean, like sticking her head over the fermenter, he'd hold his breath and stick his head over a fermenter. So when they get that gas, it would knock their head off. But I don't remember that shit. I don't remember that. I remember that. I was just dad's way of always. He had, he was going to teach you something, even subtly. You know, he just yeah. always teach. You know, mm -hmm. should have been a teacher, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the stories though are epic. Is there, is there any other, you know, funny, funny Booker stories? Cause I, I just, I, I love this stuff. I mean, you just eat that up if you're a bourbon fan. I am. They, it's, I mean, it, it got to where people were pulling stuff on him and try to pull stuff. I remember this one, I'll probably, I'll probably get struck down. Dad's probably looking down and saying, boy, you better not tell us. Don't, don't tell this what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> but he was the, his good friend Don Calhoun again had a built a deer stand down. It was a big deer stand. It was one of these like for four or five people could sit in it, you know, and yeah, overlook several acres. And they were down, down there and they'd seen some wild turkeys. It wasn't really turkey season, you know. So I kept seeing them, seeing them. So Don, they got this idea, they got a domestic turkey. Booker didn't, and they tied it up put it on a string, uh -huh. walk away. 
and they brought Booker down there, and they set up her, and I'm sure they had a few drinks, and sure, sure enough, eventually Booker saw his turkey. <laughs> I did Don look at one of his turkeys. <laughs> you know, and I could see Don reeling him in the fish he had him. He said, well, Booker, it ain't season. He said, well, shit, why don't we? He said, what if we, you know, we sneak and we can do it. So they, make a long story short, they shot this domesticated turkey, hit it, <laughs> took it home, picked it, did all this. Well, then a few days later, you know, their big secret, you know, Booker thought him and Don were the only ones knew. Well, the chief of police, who was another good friend of dad's, came walking into the, the office down at the plant uh -huh. with a T-shirt. And it said, Booker, no, Nelson County game hog. <laughs> that was a guy shooting a turkey with a foot tied to a stake. <laughs> the old man get looking at that, that you know, T-shirt. He said, where'd you get that T-shirt, Chief? <laughs> where'd you get it? They're selling them up there at the courthouse. <laughs> what? They're selling them? He said, yeah. He held it up. And dad about shit. He about died. And, and he, they gave one to Sandy, my wife. And when he saw it, he asked her, please don't wear that shirt. I don't think she ever had worn it since then. <laughs> and I mean, that was just the kind of stuff they do. You know, and he was he crawled around hiding that turkey and all this stuff. He thought it was he was breaking the law, but he really wasn't. Mm -hmm. They were just people loved to get him because he was pretty gullible, really. If if you got him, he'd believe you until you Proved you were a liar, but once you proved you were a liar, he wouldn't believe shit you said. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, Fred, you obviously had a big uh, recognition in the last year with uh, naming the new craft distillery after you. And uh, tell us, you know, what what that is going to play, and what kind of what you'll be there, and and are you are you and Freddie going to be working together on some stuff, and what what's that going to be like? Yeah, it's going to be, to be honest, it's going to be Freddie's playground. Mm hmm. You know, he's the future of our of our industry at, you know, at Bean for sure. So any research, like Booker's playground was the Booker No plant, where he could tinker with this and move that, see what happens if you divert, yep. you know, or change temperature, or change mass bill, or change anything. Now he's got a, instead of having to do 45,000 gallon fermenters, he can do smaller runs and see is there something he can really do to improve or to actually maybe open up something brand new in the bourbon industry. Mm -hmm. so it was, you know, something we've been talking about for years and years. And eventually we got our CEO to gravitate towards it and then our supporters from Japan. And now they've built it. And I mean, when they put my name on it, it was a total surprise. I couldn't believe it. I can't believe he kept that a secret. I mean, at the groundbreaking was the first time I even heard when. Really? The name of the Fred B. No Craft Distillery. I said, what? How the hell can they keep that a secret around here and me not know it? And he says that the girls were talking about it and I was in the room and didn't even pay attention. I don't know. Yeah, the, one yeah. of the PR girls was talking about it and they didn't know he was in there. And I'm like, you all got to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> But he didn't hear it, I guess. I didn't know it till he, till he said it right down at the groundbreaking down there. And that's now it's on the roof. And it's gonna be cool because then we can do some things that, you know, like dad, things change, maybe distillation proofs, you know, bypass retention tanks. We can do things, bypass vessels that are in our distillery and see if it'll affect the taste of the white dog coming off the steel. Mm -hmm. And then we can put some in barrels and see what it does after it ages. Who knows? The sky's the limit for the future. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really going to be fun for sure. And also it'll open it up for folks like you. If you come down and visit, you could come down and hopefully down the road, you might be able to make a barrel of whiskey that you want to make. Yeah. You know, that we sounds good. give you a menu and say, here you go, Steve. What do you want to do? You have to answer more than one question about the fermenter size. Though. <laughs> yeah. the There's good. a quiz you got to pass. Okay. Yeah, you have to pass it. I'll quiz. pay attention. I will pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's going to be part of the rule. If you come down to do the distill your own program, if we get one going, you're going to have to answer the book. <laughs> you have to pass Booker's quiz. <laughs> Booker's quiz. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's something I know dad would have loved to have been around. And he would have either given his eye teeth. For something like this. Yeah. Yeah. 
if he could have played a lot more than he did where he was. He played a lot, but nothing like he could have with what Freddie's going to have here. It's going to be yeah. great. And you can also demonstrate to our customers how we make bourbon the bean way. Mm -hmm. And the blending, he's going to have blending rooms in there where he can show people how to blend. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of education done. Actually, our partnership with the University of Kentucky, it's going to be part of that's going to be, you know, some of these new students who are learning about bourbon industry are going to be learning how to make bourbon at the Bean, Fred Bino Craft Distillery, the Bean Way. Mm -hmm. so it's cool for the future of the whole industry. You know, it's not just for us, it's for the whole industry too. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. Recently, we had someone on the Bourbon Show that I want to ask you to about uh, because I, I thought it was such a great show because I, I, it's a, not a household name. You know, even even people who are really Bourbon fans don't know the name Linda Hayes, but she she's worked with you guys for a long time and she does have a very important role. So if you don't mind, just talk a little bit about her and and what she what she means to you guys. Well, Linda's been around well longer than me. Yeah. <laughs> She went to work there, I think, when she was 18, 19, as a switchboard operator mm -hmm. and worked her way through college, uh, worked in the, with the lab folks over in our, our R&D department. And then most recently with our visitor experience, making taking care of my calendar, keeping me on the straight and narrow of where I'm supposed to be. You know, on these 300 days of the year, I'm on the road. You know, she was the one who took all the emails and set yeah. up the trips for, you know, going here, there, and everywhere. And, you know, she kind of knows the legacy. She worked with Dad. She worked with me. She's worked with Freddie. You know, and she's been around. I mean, and that's things. She can tell you stories, uh, you know, from living it. It's not just what she's read or what she's heard. She's seen the company go from the 80s to 2021. And she's mm -hmm. still kicking. She's still working her every day, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think Linda is like a prime example of, of what, a, what opportunity Beam can have for you, just what he went through. You know, she started as a switchboard operator. Um, I'm sure had, through the Beam program, got partially her college paid for and then got another opportunity and, and has excelled. And you see that we've got some other folks in operations that have done that as well. Actually, Linda's nephew, same thing. He started as a barrel rolling operator, got his degree, got a supervisor position, and now he's going to be joining us as a supervisor in the, the distillery. So another opportunity for him. So it, it, I like when, when Linda gets to talk, and I listen to the show uh, when you had her on because she has just she's just such so full of life, and she she's got a pretty interesting perspective. Like he said, she's kind of seen every every nook and cranny of what we have at Beam. And, um, you know, she, like I say, she's a good person to get perspective from because she's just, she sees the good in a lot of things that probably others maybe not would have seen it. So I just hear her tell some stories about times, you know, before that um, she laughs and cuts up about. I've heard other people cuss and complain about, you know. Right. So, uh, and like I said, it's just a great example of a, of a good beam employee you know that she's been very loyal to the beam and you know we say the beam family we talk about our all of our employees you know from sales all the way through but it really started and resonated with the plant and has kind of grown outward as the company's gotten much larger but but linda's really kind of the epitome of that she really came in and kind of been and bought into everything that was about beam and here she is what i think 40 years later yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Her 40, 40, That's 40 amazing. Years, this year, yeah. Yeah. If if I was there and you guys were like, oh, we, we got to go uh, to Linda. It's her it's her fortieth birthday. I would believe that. And, and she's but she's worked at oh, Bean for forty years. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's a, met her husband there. He worked. He was an employee. Yeah. Uh, you know, William. They would come help us do entertaining here at the house. Uh, William, helped me get, yeah. Yeah, William helped me get through a lot of dinners. You know, he was, he, you know, he, Linda and, and dad, you know, they were doing, th you know, doing the dinner thing and he'd be off sitting in the corner and me and him talk about basketball or golf or whatever. So it was a good distraction for him and me. So it, right. I was really close with. Yeah. With and a promotion. Husband. I mean, they would go out and do bourbon tastings, yeah. 
at events all over the state for, you know, the company, you know, I mean, I, they did it on their own. I mean, but sure, we gave them the product, but they would give their time. It wasn't really part of their job. They just like talking about the products and, you know, they're, they're part of the Beam family. I mean, we you know, had misfortune passed away and but Linda's still hanging right in there. And yeah, you know, she's, yeah. A, she's a, she's a keeper now. And she'll be there when I'm dead and gone, probably. <laughs> She'll still be going. Yeah. I don't know what they're going to do when Linda's gone. I mean, yeah. I tease her a lot, but she's she is part of the family. You know, I give her yeah. a hard time as much as I can. Cause yeah, we, she we talks about she likes giving like, you a hard time. That's your relationship. You know, oh, yeah. we, we, we go back and forth like brother and oh, sister. Yeah, that's you what know? I was going to say. They're like brother and sister, and I got to <laughs> yeah. listen to both of them. <laughs> both <sides. laughs> right, right. We bitch about each other, you know. Yeah. But you know, if anybody gives each other gives one of the other one shit, the other one steps up real quick, you know. Yeah. We can give each other a hard time, but don't anybody else. Don't, don't anybody it. else. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh a couple a couple of the questions that have come in on the chat, if you don't mind. Um uh, Tim is asking about uh, uh, some sort of party where a bunch of people got invited over and he says Booker uh, and about 300 people at the house or something like that. I heard that was Fred. What, what's the real story here? I heard that uh, sometime somebody invited a bunch of people over and more people came over and soon there's like a 300 people at the house. Was that Booker or was that you, Fred? That was Booker. That was Booker. Okay. Get that straight. The blue Knights. <laughs> Get that straight. Oh, the Blue Knights. Yeah. All right. I wouldn't, uh, my dad, again, with his good friend, Don Calhoun, and a couple of FBI guys. Uh, the Blue Knights is a motorcycle group. Yeah, they made the officer, Booker Batch, yeah. yeah. Who ride motorcycles, not for work, but for fun. Mm -hmm. they, Kentucky would always have a reunion, like on Memorial Day weekend. They have a little gathering and all these people come from all over the country. They meet, get together, have their cookouts and meeting and all that. Anyway. Dad goes over on a Friday night to join him, you know, just to have a little fun. He's over in Shepherdsville, Kentucky, which is right down the road from the plant. Uh, Dad gets over there and obviously probably partake too many uh, Jim Beams. And he got to be buddies with all these police officers. And he just had decided to invite them to lunch. This Memorial Day weekend, well, the next morning, Saturday morning of Memorial Day weekend, he called his good friend Tuggy Dick from Kurt's restaurant, mm -hmm. and she came up for breakfast. Uh, Mom was there pouring the coffee. And he asked me to come over, and I walked over and we sat down. He said, "We're, we're gonna throw a little party this afternoon. You know, it's a holiday weekend. It's okay." And Tuggy said, "Well, for how many? Oh, just a few." <laughs> he said, well, how, "How many? So we know how much food to get. Oh, about three hundred. I thought my mother was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> 300. Great. And that's what showed up that Saturday for a uh, first thing we had to do was go out and find enough chickens and hamburgers and to feed 300 people. Yeah. You know, we're out buying every hamburger bun, every chicken breast, every, you know, on Memorial day weekend. And then we <laughs> cooked it all up and they showed up. And did it for a couple of years, the Blue yeah, Knights. Three or four. We actually did a batch of Booker's dad did, and uh, we called it the Blue Knights batch. Yeah. yeah. He formed a good relationship with the Blue Knights. I mean, like Dad said, you can't ever have too many friends that are police officers. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, another question came in about Old Tub. Now, initially we heard Old Tub was uh, coming in, kind of a special release, and but it seemed like it it, it was like a one-time thing, and it, it did kind of come and go away, at least where I'm at in St. Louis, but now it's come back, and it's it's everywhere. I, I see it. So is it a regular item now? It's going to stay on the shelves? Um, it's it's not. A, it's going to be a limited release, so it'll kind of be on, but not on. <laughs> Uh, kind of like little book, but a little bit more available than that. Obviously. Okay. But gotcha. Where it'll come out in a, in a, in a, in a batch form towards the end of the year, or pretty sure it's going to be, might be two releases this year. I'll have to check. So there might be one coming in the earlier part of the year. And then uh, again, later this year as well. So kind of, I, I, I wouldn't call it an LTO, but I wouldn't call it a, a permanent, you know, either. So somewhere in between, I guess. Well, yeah. Well, it's really fantastic, and you know when, you, especially when you factor in the value of it, it's it's just amazing. Well, down the, the old there, 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 there you go. Now you're talking some real old tub there. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was fun. That, was, that bottle's got a story. Mm -hmm. 
I might have, my mom, since I already, I'm sure pissed my father off. <laughs> my mother's gonna say, why is he gonna tell this story? <laughs> I don't know if you can see it or not, but the top is taped on with Scott's tape. <laughs> this bottle was full of old tub. Even the, the side of the, the <laughs> label is Scott's tape too, if you please. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, my mother, she enjoyed her bourbon quite a bit, a little more than she probably needed to there for a while. And she found this bottle of old tub we had stashed as a memento. And she, she proceeded to empty it and she taped it up and said, well, it fell over. <laughs> and the top was leaking. Well, it leaked out pretty good, Bob. God <laughs> state. Huh. She didn't like it because she knew I'd busted her for drinking the, the last bottle of real old tub. Real old tub. Yeah, yeah. That, was actually my father's drinking whiskey till he released Booker's. That's what he drank till the company discontinued, discoded, as they say. Yeah. yeah. He raised hell with our Chicago office. That's my drinking whiskey. You can't quit <laughs> selling it. Right. A four year old bottled in bond. And, you know, in the 70s, that wasn't what people wanted. They mm -hmm. wanted to start drinking vodka. They wanted light stuff. They didn't want underproof bottled in bond bourbon. Yeah. Now, Fred, did your wife use uh, one of your bottles of Booker's Rye to make uh, so, some cocktails or something? Yeah. One of my buddies told me that, that you, you had told him that. I just, uh, I didn't know if that's true or not. Is that, is that yeah. a true story? Uh, yeah, I, I guess if we might as well tell the host. Too. Yeah. I might as well get her too. My piss off. <laughs> sure, let's. let's yeah, we told just stories. don't get my wife. I mean, she's <laughs> yeah, we can't tell anybody. she's on here. We can't tell these stories. Yeah. So. But they, we had to, when we did the Booker's Rye, you know, we had a, a reject bottle and the plant manager gave it to Freddie and said, take it home. You and your dad can have it to let somebody taste. If somebody's over, you want to let them taste right. it. Yeah. You got a little, you got a, you know, a reject bottle. Scuff label, label was kind of scuffed <laughs> up pretty good. It got stuck in the line, but yeah. So basically you could not open a, a good package, you know, you keep, keep the good one sealed. Yeah. And Freddie discovered that the bottle was empty. So he hit me up, Dad, you drink all that Booker's rice? <laughs> no, I didn't. He said, well, who did? He said, it was your mom. What? How the hell did mom do it? <laughs> and what it all came down to was we had an event here, and one of the bartenders had brought a bunch of ginger beer, and it sat in the corner for some time. And our master mixologist, Bobby G., Bobby Gleason, uh -huh. was in town. And Sandy was saying, Bobby, what's a drink I can make with this ginger beer so I can drink it up and get rid of it? I'm tired of walking around it. So he pulled a bottle of Jim Beam rye out and fixed her a mule. Uh -huh. Ginger beer, lime, and rye. So she, she proceeded to take the Booker's rye and make mules <laughs> and drink the whole bottle of it. Oh, I mean, a swallow was left. Really? You, gotta, you couldn't have wet your whistle with it. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Freddie was getting on her, she goes, well, didn't your grandfather always say drink it any damn way you want to? <laughs> there you go. There you yeah. go. <laughs> Shut me down, but. <laughs> Shut me down. Yeah. I'm the complaining, but I still thought, hell, there's Knob Creek rye. That's damn good rye. You don't. All right. You're going to mix it with ginger <laughs> beer. Rye. Right, right, right. Uh, but, you know. Well, guys, obviously I could talk to you guys the whole time, but I do want to leave some time for, for our audience here. So if, uh, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and they've got a question for a friend and Freddie, feel free to open up the mic and ask away. I had a question here about an old Jim Beam label that I brought with me here. Uh, let me get it centered up. Jacob's Well. Jacob's Well. I believe it's back from the 80s. I just, yeah, there you go. I wondered if you guys could tell me a little bit about the history because this is just a mini. I'll and... tell you the, the story. When we found Jacob Beam's original whale over in where Washington, Marion, and Nelson County meet, a little place called Manton, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. and Dad's original theory was we'll draw water out of this whale and make some whiskey. But when they got over there and looked at the whale, there wasn't enough water in it to make a barrel. So we just mingled some, some bourbons together, but he wanted the original plan 
was to actually take water out of the old Jacob Beam well and make the whiskey with it, but it wasn't, it didn't have enough water in it to, to do any good. So we, we pretty much blended, I guess it was kind of blended what you would call it, micro barreled, you know, taken out of one barrel, put in another. It's funny, that product only sold in one state really well, and it was Alabama. I don't know what the people of Alabama saw in Jacob's Well. Really? Nobody else saw, but it sold like hotcakes in Alabama. And towards the end of its career, they were taking all we got back from other distributors and sending it to Alabama. And Sends to Alabama. Alabama. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. Kind of weird. That is fascinating. Yeah. Um, uh, so at the end of its time, probably we did it today. Oh, yeah. The story behind it, it would probably be a, a big seller. But just at the time, just in, yeah, in the timing's time. everything sometimes. Yeah. A uh, question about distiller's cut. Is that going to be coming back? That's a good question. Uh, currently, no, it is not slated to come back. Um, we had looked at maybe doing another repeal batch, uh, which similar time frame for release from the original distiller's cut. Um, but we're kind of looking at how we're looking at innovation on Jim Beam right now, to be honest. So, I don't want to commit to saying we are doing a repeal batch and we may actually pull back. I, have to, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but I've got something that um, could be coming on Jim Beam for a, a limited release that could become a permanent thing, depending on how these barrels turn out. But I don't want to go into a lot of detail on that. Right. But it's, it's uh, so th there could be some shifting of what we do with with it. But I would say you, you'll probably see some form of a, maybe, I don't, it probably won't be the sales could probably be repeal batch um, or something, something different. The repeal batch was a, uh, it was pretty the good. cut was pretty damn and good. The distiller's cut was, yeah. The yeah. Cut was People good. who discovered it liked it and they would like to have more of it. That's actually what I had in that. I had that in my tasting with Kay the last week. You know, I laid out some of that distiller's cut. It was a good, good whiskey, good bourbon. Yeah. Other questions? Anybody want to take the mic off and ask a question? Fred, uh, got a question for you with your your combination efforts that you did with the, our friends over the over the Pacific. With, uh, was it Legant and uh, any other uh, different uh, collaborations you're working with with uh, you know blended Japanese and and Kentucky bourbon and. And I know we talked prior, Freddie, you talked about some of the lessons learned of, of production and what's going on, what, what lasts in Japan and what wouldn't, what, what wouldn't fly over here and vice versa. But any other special projects or anything like that, collaborations you got going on or any lessons learned? We're working with Shinji. Yeah, Legion, we, uh, we're, we're playing with some stuff right now. We'll just see. You know, I mean, like Freddie, you don't want to let much out of the bag because you hope it turns out. We're, we're playing with some stuff and seeing what it's going to do. You know, they do things a little different. It was funny, you know, listening to Sinji and learning how they, I guess the one thing that really got me is how when they taste, they taste several hundred samples. They spit them all out. I swallow and that kind of blew Sinji's mind that I, that I don't spit, you know, but it, it was fun for me because I could, my language, my Japanese was about as good as his English. Well, his English is probably oh, better yeah. than my Japanese. <laughs> we had to use each other's eyeballs. You know, I could tell if he liked it or I know he could tell what I liked because stuff I didn't like, I made a face. But we uh, we got through it and it was it was an honor to work with him. Shinji's a very meticulous guy and he, he does things. I mean, when somebody eats the same thing every day, so it doesn't affect his palate. That's pretty serious about tasting. Yeah. You know, yeah. No onions are allowed in the room when he's working. Not even allowed in the room. That's, wow, that's pretty slick. I mean, I never thought about that influencing the taste, but it would, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're, we're working on some stuff. We're always kicking stuff back and forth and yeah. seeing what I possibly could, could do for the future. You know, and Legion kind of fell by the wayside because of on-premise got shut down. That was a predominantly an on-premise brand, and we were going to build it through the bars, and 
all the bars got shut down in 2020. So hopefully in 2021, we're going to be able to kind of reintroduce it a little bit and maybe get it out there for, because it's only in eight markets in the United States. We were going really? to slowly release it. We didn't want to, you know, we didn't have it much to begin with because of the secondary aging. You know, you didn't, we didn't have that much to begin. Now we're building up the inventories. So we're going to try to re-release it in 2021 and 2022. So, you know, mm -hmm. people will hear the story. A lot of you probably never heard the story where we took the bourbon and finished it in red wine barrels and sherry butts, then blended it back together with some more bourbon. So it's predominantly bourbon, but influenced with the red wine and sherry barrel. Yeah. I saw a question come in through the, the chat function about bakers. What, what went into the decision to make it from, you know, the small batch to the single barrel? We wanted to really breathe some life into bakers was kind of getting passed over. You know, if you look at the four small batch, it always kind of was the number four seller. And it wanted to, we wanted to get the story out there about Baker, the man, Baker mm -hmm. being yeah. our cousin. And so releasing it as a single barrel, it gave us some, uh, you know, we could change it, change the packaging, you know, and be able to get the story out there. And Freddie's been working quite a bit on the re-release of the bakers with Baker being involved, you know, with picking the package, with tasting. So it's going to be, uh, you know, great future, we hope, for the Baker's bourbon. Because there were some loyal fans of Baker's bourbon, but just not a whole lot of them. But we're... We're slowly trying to let it grow, and I think it's it's picking up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. In that's 2020, good. it's hard to say. Well, people aren't out there in the on premise. That's where people try new stuff. If nobody's out in a bar, how do you try new things? You know. So, speaking of new things, I got kind of a question. I saw uh, the label for the new Basil Hayden's Toasted. Oh, nice. And I was hoping. First, congratulations. <laughs> You're the first person that's asked about it since I got the notification that it's basically the it's public knowledge. Yeah. So I wanted to get your perspective about your approach to toasted bourbon. What you think. Do you think it's just a, a, a trend right now for bourbon drinkers? Or do you think uh, it's going to be something we see long term? Do you see it incorporating more into the Jim Beam portfolio? or just as this limited option? Well, I, you know, I won't answer all of those. I'll try to answer uh, some of it. I'll start with Appreciate it. Basil Hayden Toast. I wouldn't say that Basil Hayden Toast is our, our version of toasted bourbon. It is the Basil Hayden version of a, of a toast. So it's gonna be a little bit more approachable, um, fit a little bit more in line. But I think some of the elements I seen our buddy Andrew was on here. He he helped me work with with that one, um, Andrew Wybrink from from ISC. Um, I think it's a it, it'll be a good one for people to, to taste on basil because I think it, it it definitely elevates the the depth of the character, uh, changes a little bit. Still can't get my name right. Well, God damn it, you won't ever tell me your last name. That's why I say it different every time I say it. <laughs> <laughs> we bring uh, yeah we we yeah. yeah okay so but yeah so basil basil toast definitely is kind of a it's gonna be 80 proof obviously so it's kind of like i said basil's version of a toasted barrel take um, i would say we've got other projects with toasted barrels i would say that i would just consider that as another form of a way to experiment within the whiskey industry whether it's toasted barrel uh, seasoning of wood, uh, char level or toast char. Um, you know, there's just so many different things that you can do with those, with those barrels. I would say, I wouldn't say that you'll see it go away and I wouldn't say it's going to be the next big thing. I think there's a lot of stuff right now that's allowing us, like, like dad said, the stuff that granddaddy started, it's allowing us to do these explorations. So I'd say you'll see more of it before you'll see less of it, but I, I would never say that you'd probably see it go away because I think as you explore more with whiskey, you know, that was a specific project for basil. You know, if we come across something different and, and it fits a toasted barrel, I know a couple of whiskeys I, I've got coming to my head that are already in toasted barrels that I know you'll see the, 
the toasted barrel form come at some point when I can't, I, I can't necessarily detain that just yet, but um, so I would say it, it should be here to stay in some form. Now I wouldn't say it's going to be, you know, the next big thing. Um, I just think there's just so much to be, I, I, I wouldn't think there's anything to be the next big thing. I think just this, this flavor exploration is going to be the thing that continues to, to widen and that, Toasted Barrels is definitely here to play in that category. Hey, Steve, I got a quick question, if you don't mind. Sure, Wes. Yeah, a, a couple, it's kind of a two-parter. One, do you, does Jim Beam own any heritage brand uh, labels that have been discontinued and that are not on the market? If so, do you plan on releasing anything? And kind of the second part of that would be, as part of that activity, you know, you've got bakers, you've got bookers. Do you plan on uh, maybe even creating a, any more brands to honor some more of the past ancestors uh, in the family who were master distillers and part of that legacy? It's funny. There's four bottles of whiskey sitting probably 10 feet from my laptop, and you all would probably die to see the name. <laughs> I would. Uh, but I'm not going to share it. I'm not going to share what it's about <laughs> anything just yet because – well, I don't know. It, it, it might be coming quicker than you think as far if, if you're trolling, if, you, if you're catching toast, you, you might catch this one coming uh, pretty quick. So, yeah, it, it should be coming pretty soon, I would say. Okay. Uh, but so definitely you, you'll see that. I think, uh, as I touched on, there's so many avenues of exploration. And as I've told, told you folks on here before, probably if you've heard me, a lot of our brands stand for certain things. So certain you may not see you i'll be honest you won't see a booker's toasted barrel ever it'll never happen i can promise you that mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so just like you won't see basil hayden cast strength so those things kind of put us as we say guardrails that we sit in meetings and my dad spikes coke cans if it gets too far out of what we think the guardrail should be um but but anyway these brands have those. So if we're going to continue to try to be leaders in the industry, which that's the goal of mine anyways, I don't know, hopefully, I mean, that's what the company says we're, we're, our direction is. So I, I tend to believe that way there will be more brands and more other opportunities to share more stories of heritage, to share more process stories. And I would say they'll be coming a lot quicker. Somebody probably just named one right there. There you go. Bingo. Really? Matthew got it. Hardens Creek, Jacobs Well. Yep, that'll be a release coming pretty quickly. It's yeah, it's it's on there. I wasn't gonna let you all know yeah, that. that that's my last name, so that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you gotta be all over that, Wes. I'm yeah. all over it. I'm I'm on it. Uh, there you go. So yeah, Hardens Creek is where Jacobs Well is. Hardens Creek is the creek where we started making whiskey, where Jacob landed um right here in, or you know, about 10 minutes down the road and in Washington County and and everything you were saying that's the reason for it I've been adamantly saying we've got to have a place where where we can tell more depth of heritage stories not tied to one person uh, so you see Hardin's Creek Jacobs Well a little teaser Jacobs Well is the first release under Hardin's Creek ah. uh, Hardin's Creek will be will probably be surfacing again as a as a label name and Jacobs Well will be a a release under that there's been a lot of good info on this one. Yeah. Yeah. There's some good stuff here. So have another drink. We'll get you really. Got, talking. Yeah. It's yeah. so funny. I got the Basil Hayden toast one probably two weeks ago. So it's been out there a little bit. Now the Hardens Creek one, it, it just popped up. I don't know. I, I, I remember when I was, I think I was in the car with Kay when I got the email that Hardens Creek was now public knowledge. I, I have to ask her. I can't remember. It might've been last week. But so, yeah, it hadn't been out there too long. Sounds either. like Matthew, you know, there's a lot of people who do. I mean, I got another buddy checks it every day, every mm -hmm. day. It's part of his daily routine at his desk. I, get on it. I don't know what the hell I'm looking for. I can't, <laughs> right? yeah, I can't, I can't find anything either. I, I can't yeah. ever find anything. Yeah. We did have <laughs> kind of the, <laughs> <laughs> we did have kind of the ultimate fan questions come in. So I'll, I'll pose it to both of you. So it's kind of a three-parter. So it's your, your favorite beam product, your favorite non-beam product, and then your favorite batch of bookers is some of the questions that come through here. So, uh, Freddie, we'll ask you first. Favorite beam, favorite oh. non-beam, and favorite batch of bookers? I would say favorite beam. Mm. 
That's a tough one. It's a large portfolio for sure. If you're saying like something readily available, I would have to go Knob Creek. But to be honest, not to not to get everybody's mouth watering, I would say that Jacobs Will is probably uh, probably the best whiskey I've tasted that I've put together. I would say. Okay, um, that's cool. So it, it's right at ten years old. Um, so a little bit older than Knob Creek, but yeah, um, it'd be interesting to see what other others think. But I would say Knob Knob Creek. I just like that profile. There's a lot coming from the barrel there. Um, it, it just does a lot and shows the justice of time in that vessel and shows that you just can't replicate it. You know, that's the one thing for me is Knob Creek's a good one to show. You can't make a small barrel taste like that at, at any point, you know, or a big right. barrel either. Um, it's to me that that essence of what goes on there and finding it nine years is something that's that's good. So I would say Knob Creek, favorite Booker's batch. I would say Anis's answer or Oven Buster. Oven Buster, because the look my grandmother gave me and he made me deliver it. You know, the one where she <laughs> her blowing the door open with Booker's the first time we brought it home. <laughs> I'm putting it on the pork loin. Um, I really like that whiskey, but I like the kind of nostalgia with it. And then the anise's answer, why I say that one, it, again, I like the, the the taste of it, but it's one I've used a lot when I flambe for, for Kay and myself. You know, I'll do some steaks and throw a little little whiskey on there and light it, um, or pork. And I'll be honest with you, it's that is my favorite whiskey to flambe with that I've tasted. So I would say a tie between those two. Um, okay. The non-beam, probably Russell's Reserve is what I, I would have to say. That we got a bottle sitting right here, and and when you said that, I looked down, I seen that, and honestly, the best one I've had of that bunch was one that we did a recording with Jimmy and Eddie, or excuse me, with Eddie and Bruce for the Kentucky Bourbon Festival back in September, and they brought a bottle down, and and we were sipping on it afterwards, and I hadn't had it in a while, and it just kind of reminded me. Um, it, it, I'll be honest with you, why it is, is it just has such a, a very close resemblance to our whiskey. To me, it, it just reminds me of my granddaddy a lot, to be honest. Mm -hmm. and, and rightfully so, I'm sure him and, him and Jimmy traded a lot of trade secrets and a lot of, yeah. a lot of stuff probably similar between the- Over a few drinks, I'm sure. Yeah. So, yeah, right, right. I'd say, <laughs> yeah. right. I'd say enough drinks to probably sell a few cases, you know? Right. <laughs> right. That could be a new brand in itself, the the the, the Booker and Jimmy, yeah, drunken collection, the drinking, <laughs> the drinking collection, yeah. Fred, how about you? Same same thing, beam product, non beam, and Booker's batch. Well, the Booker's batch always gravitate back to the twenty fifth anniversary because that's one that the liquid was about almost ten years old. Yeah, and it was one of the first ones that I guess Freddie had just come to work at the plant and they had us in the warehouse filming. And I remember I asked him, what do you think granddaddy would say about this one? And he said, I mm -hmm. think he'd like it. And it was just cool to see, you know, him him agree that that's what Booker would like. And it just always ran good to me. We were in that warehouse. It tasted damn good at that time. So yeah, yeah. Kind of always been yeah, my yeah. favorite batch of all of them. <clears throat> non-beam, I always go back to the rare breed. You know, it's kind of funny. Eddie and myself, over the years, we swap. I'd give him Knob Creek, he'd give me rare breed. You know, nobody really knew, you know, these swaps we're making, but you know, we right. we swap out each other. These is before we met when we were kids. And when we got in the industry, out of the blue, we just, just what do you like? I, I like that rare breed. Either he gives me a case, I give him a case, and we just kind of throw liquor back and forth to each other, you know, because, you know, I just like Freddie. What I think Jimmy and Booker kind of made bourbon the same way and kind of their philosophies. Because if you look at the ages, you know, Jimmy, if it gets over eight years old, Jimmy's kind of pissed off. <laughs> yeah. Old. You know, dad was the same way. I mean, they're cut from the same cloth. So if you found liquor that Jimmy liked, I guarantee you Booker was going to like it and vice versa. So I remember when Jimmy was working on Russell's Reserve, he pulled a bottle out of his pocket at the Bourbon Festival one year and said, I want you to taste something. And so I pulled up a couple of glasses 
I said, damn, that's good. What is it? He said, I want to hear what he's got to say, talking about Booker. And Dad poured, knocked out that slug. And, Give me another shot at Jimmy. He poured him another cut. And he said, that's pretty good shit. What is that? It's something I'm working on, Russell's Reserve. And that made me feel, I said, look, this guy is bringing what he's working on to Booker to ask his opinion. Yeah. And he, he said, I like hearing what you got to say, but I want to hear what he's got to say. Mm -hmm. like, you know, you're a young boy. We want to hear what the old man's got to say. And knowing that those two trusted each other to do it, and it's just the way they were. I mean, they were like brothers. It's, you know, I always get I get a little choked up talking about it because it was good times. Yeah, so, you know, I can sit back and listen to those two give each other a hard time and laugh and giggle and carry on. They, they just loved it. They loved the bourbon industry. Loved everything about it. All the people in it. It was great. Yeah, I would say those two together in their prime like that would be like a reality, live reality show. You know, it, it, it was, you just do want to just sit back and watch. So, and then Fred, uh, your favorite beam product too, I guess. I always I gravitate towards the Knob Creek quite a bit. I was on the road so much, but yes. I always the Jim Beam Black was one I cut my teeth on when I was a kid, and that's probably what I drink a lot of. I mean, I always liked that. You know the. the about that 90 proof, you know, if you're going to just take a little shot over rocks. But no, nah, or Jimmy and Black, probably the two I gravitate towards the most. Yeah. Uh, we got one time for, time for one more question. Again, I don't want to keep these guys. Uh, obviously, we could talk to them. We're bourbon fans. We could talk to these guys till midnight. I, we, we can't do that. Uh, but we do have time for one more question. Somebody want to open up the mic and ask a question. Who's going to be first? To hit unmute and looks like Bronner's trying if he can figure it out. He can't right. figure out how to get the mute off. If <laughs> I can't figure out which there question to ask. <laughs> okay. All right. We got Bronner. We got Bronner's gonna ask a question. All right. You you, you get a Bronner, your last question. Make it a good one. I I can't even I don't even know where to be. You want to know my favorite <laughs> color? Is that what you said? You still bringing them old crow bottles down there? <laughs> Remember that time you had that Dean White label? That was awesome. He's like Chris Farley all of a sudden. He's locking up on us. <laughs> oh, I don't even know. I'm, 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 I'm shit. It, it's not oh, any. That was eloquent. That was good. That was that's a good way to end it on, on that note. So, Jason, thank you for your submission. <laughs> we really appreciate it. <laughs> well, Fred and Freddie, you know, I, I I can't thank you guys enough for coming on and doing this. This was great. Really had a good time with you guys. And uh, you know, uh, and I know the audience here feels the exact same way. I, every single one of them would probably like to say thank you. And uh, because you guys are awesome. Cool. Well, thank you. We Steve. love doing it. Yeah. Well, let's it's a little round of applause for Fred and Freddie for coming on and entertaining us and talking suburban. Thanks guys. Thank you. Take care guys. Appreciate it. I'm going to turn off the recorder. Thank you. See you, man. Be good, Steve.